here together to be able to worship the Lord today. Uh, to those of you who might be Carolina fans, you're welcome for the extra 30 minutes of rest you needed this morning. Any, anybody but Carolina. Anyway, <laughs> pray for us. Still, still, look, we're never going to hear the end of it. Duke folks, state folks. We're, we're enjoying summer already, so. Hey, welcome to worship. It is good to be in the house of the Lord together. Good to be amongst family and, and friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to welcome those who might be visiting us this morning. We are so glad that you are here with us, and we hope that you feel at home. I want to welcome those who are joining us online as well. We are glad that you are here, and you are uh, just as much part of, of the presence here this morning. And I would like to encourage you to uh, put something in the comment section, say hello to one another so we can uh, see that sense of community there online. If you are visiting us this morning and you would like to connect with the church, if you're online, you can go to our website, firstbaptistfarmville.org, and you can follow up with us there, uh, find our email addresses and, and uh, touch base. If you're here in person and would like contact from the church, part of this bulletin does tear out. You can put your uh, contact information there and let us know how you would like to be reached out to. And then at the, at the conclusion of the service, you can place those little slips in the offering plates that are located um, on either side of me here at the front of the sanctuary and at, uh, on the Wilson Street side of the sanctuary in the vestibule, there are offering plates there. Additionally, for giving of tithes and offerings, you can do so using uh, the offering plates in the sanctuary. You can also give online at firstbaptistfarmville.org or you can drop off um, your offering, your tithes and offerings or mail them to the church office during the week. Uh, this morning we have a, a several announcements you've probably already seen scrolling uh, on, on the uh, screens or uh, you can see them in the bulletin, but I do want to mention them just to make sure that we're all aware. Uh, next Sunday, April the 10th, we're going to have following worship, a brief church council meeting in the fellowship hall. So if you are a committee uh, chairperson uh, or you're a staff person, just do remember that that is happening um, and it's going to be in the fellowship hall, and it's not going to be super long. Just want to make sure our, our calendars are coordinated um, and, and talk a little bit about some of the things coming in the summer and early next fall. Um, additionally, next Sunday, uh, there in the afternoon, will be an Easter trunk or treat. And so this is happening from 3 p.m. until. And um, if you have any questions about that, you can ask Holly. But basically, we need some people to roll out like you do at Halloween but have a trunk and it be Easter themed, and that's what we're that's what we're gonna do. Right? Don't to you don't have to be as elaborate. So, who has a vehicle? Okay, if you have a vehicle, you can participate, and you uh, can go buy some candy. You can participate. Um, do want to make sure you're aware, even though we're a, a week ahead. Um, Palm Sunday begin is next Sunday, and that begins Holy Week. Um, our Holy Week schedule is listed here on the right side um, of the bulletin. Uh, we have basically services every day except for Friday and Saturday. Uh, do note that the Wednesday evening fast food fellowship and Bible study will not happen that Wednesday, but it is happening this Wednesday. And we do want to uh, give you a reminder about that, that we are uh, still meeting on Wednesdays. Um, we we uh, met this past Wednesday, and, and uh, come on out. It's a good time. Bring your own food. I know that's a little different than how things used to be, but... Uh, there's some fast food places around, or you can go to Greenville and get whatever you want. Come on at 5.30. We have a good time fellowshipping, e eating a meal together, and then at 6.15 having Bible study, um, activities for the children. Um, and then you can hang around and join the choir at 7, right? There we go. All right, so just do remember that. Um, uh, also, I want to, uh, to let you know that we have, we are in the process, okay? Now, I say in the process of getting our Sunday school classes back going. Not all of them are going yet. Um, so if you are leading a Sunday school class, please reach out to me. Just send me an email or call me. I just want to make sure I have all the details as far as uh, your class. Um, if it's you know, gender specific, um, if there's an age specific specificity to that, we want to begin producing a handout so that people can know where they can go if they want to go to Sunday school. So please reach out to me. If we don't have a Sunday school to meet a particular need, we will begin trying to find teachers and, and get the ball rolling on that. So again, this is a process, and uh, hopefully in the next month or two we can get um, ha have an offering for every age group and, uh, and gender. Uh, the last thing I want to say is a huge, huge thanks to our congregation 
for the way that, um, that you gave, you participated, you invested in our youth uh, last, last week. The, the total that I received was just over $8,000 in fundraising was done for the youth, and uh, that's incredible, y'all. So thank you so, so much uh, for that. Um, this time I want to ask you to uh, join your hearts with me in prayer as we begin this time of worship together. Holy Father, we thank you so much for your love and grace that has been poured lavishly upon us. God, as we stand together this morning and worship you in spirit and truth, Lord, we pray that uh, you would enjoy this uh, offering of ourselves back to you. Uh, you are totally worthy, and, and we give you thanks and praise for being who you are, being on your throne. Even though our world sometimes seems chaotic, uh, you know the end of the story, and you know uh, that you're available to us in the midst of it. And, and so, God, we pray that we will continue seeking you and finding how we are to be the people that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Our psalm this morning comes from Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy. And the other nations said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, as streams renew the desert. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, and, but they sing as they return with the harvest. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Now if you all stand and please join me for hymn number 147. <laughs>
Let us pray. God, we give you, again give you such thanks for this day. We give you thanks for all of, the, uh, all of the blessings that you have heaped upon us. And we give thanks for the ways that you've shown up in our time of need. Lord, our, our hope is that we're able to come this morning and worship you in a time of abundance. But the reality is, Lord, that we all carry things. Some of our burdens feel heavy and weighty. And so, God, we bring those and lay them before you. God, some of our actions lead us to approach you with a feeling of guilt or unworthiness. And so not only do we give you the things that we carry in our worries and our anxieties, but we ask for forgiveness of our sins. The sins that the devil would like to use to, to steal, kill, and destroy what you want to build up and, and, and bring in our lives that you call beautiful and a blessing to this world. God, we thank you for this family of faith, and we thank you for the ways that we're called to surround one another in prayer and to lift each other up. And so, God, we this morning think of Linda and Kenny, of Ronnie and Alex, Bobby, Joe, Christine, Dale, Carol, Al, and the many others who, who are going through various things right now. Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for healing. We pray for a calm in the midst of the storm. We pray for a special presence of you in their lives and in their families' lives. We ask for great healing, and we pray that in the name of Jesus. God, we know that sometimes you are calling us to also be involved in the healing process, to be your hands and feet to our brothers and sisters. So God, we pray that you would continually show us how we can show up, how we can be there. Maybe we don't have the words to say or know all the answers, but God, you've called us to be there for one another, to carry each other's burdens. You've called us to share love. So we pray you'll continue to show us how to do that. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. And now I invite you to stand and uh, sing together, Jesus at the Center.
Our New Testament reading today comes from Philippians 3, verses 4 through 14. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if ever there was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for the righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless, worthless compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things, or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to perfect, possess that perfection, for dear brothers and sisters. Excuse me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. This is the word of the Lord. At this time, if I can have all the kids come down to the front. Yeah, you can sit right here. Have a seat. Have a seat, have a seat. How are y'all this morning? Good. Before I do the children's message, there's one thing that um, I forgot to tell Pastor Graham to announce. Next Sunday is called Palm Sunday, and we're going to do something special next Sunday morning during service. So parents, ears up, ears open. Kids, you guys are going to walk in with palm branches next Sunday. So I need all of you guys here kind of early next Sunday morning. Can you do that? Parents, can we get them here? So online parents, maybe? So we're going to walk in with palm branches to kind of honor Palm Sunday, and Pastor Graham will explain more about what that is on Palm Sunday, okay? So now for our children's message. Have you ever guys raced each other? Yeah, I had no, I, no doubt that you had. Luke, absolutely. Have you, have you two raced each other? You've never run against your sister? One saying yes, one saying no. So, yeah, that's pretty typical for siblings. Have you ever raced anyone? Yeah. Have you ever watched a track, a track meet where people are racing around the track trying to win, be the fastest person? Have you ever watched something like that, especially during the Olympics or something like that? Yeah. They're trying to be the fastest. Well, I read one coach's notes to his, his athletes, and there was two important things he told them, and I'm going to tell you those two things now. The first says, don't look back. Don't look back. He says, when you look behind you, you're spending energy and time turning around and looking. Number two, when you're turning around looking, you're losing sight of what's in front of you. You're losing sight of the finish line, and it slows you down. If you keep looking back, do you think you're going to win the race? All right, tell me about that later, okay? He's already got it all figured out how to win, so we're going to learn tips from him later. But you slow yourself down. If you keep doing this number and running, you're not going to win. You're going to trip and fall more than likely or run into somebody in front of you. Do you know that kind of the passage that I just read, that's kind of what he was talking about? That was saying, don't look back at what was behind you. I'm going to read a couple of verses again, just so you guys can hear it, and I'm hoping I didn't lose my place. And of course, I lost my place. Give me one second. There it goes. Listen to these two verses, okay? <coughs> this is 12, 
through 14, three verses. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, meaning he's not perfect. He, he does wrong. But I press on to possess that perfection. He keeps trying because that's how Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. He's not there yet. But he focuses on the one thing. He focuses on Christ. Forgetting the past and looking forward, looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. That means don't worry about what's in the past. Don't look back at what happened yesterday or last year. Look ahead, because Christ is ahead of us. He's in every step we take. He's with you right now. Even you, Levi. He's with you right now, too, okay? And yes, we've all made mistakes. How many of us last year didn't listen to mom and dad? Mm -hmm. Is there a day you forgot to make your bed? Yeah. So we've all made mistakes. And I, I guess if I polled our congregation, every hand would be up eventually. So we all make mistakes. Don't dwell on those. Don't keep thinking about what you did in the past, okay? Keep your eyes focused on Christ, on Jesus, and know that he loves you and he's with you, and just keep focusing on him, and we will achieve that perfection in Christ once we go to heaven with him. All right, let's pray. Creator God, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for giving us something to focus on and help us to keep our hearts and eyes on you at all times. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
How many of you flourish in life because of well-placed reminders? <coughs> reminders are important, aren't they? I have a little, a little book that, uh, that I carry around with me pretty much all during the week. And it's all bent up. It's the shape of, I guess, my pocket becomes when I sit down. Um, and it's got, it's got list after list after list of, of reminders that I make to myself of things that I have to do. Maybe this morning you're not spurred along to think of all the things that, that you've remembered that have contributed to you flourishing, life, flourishing in life, but I'm sure that, that you uh, know very well of the things you've forgotten, <laughs> right? Anybody? Anybody ever, you don't, no one forgets things very often around here? Because on my list I have some other, some things that even though they're on my list I've forgotten to do. Unfortunately, some of these things fall into my honey-do list. I see Gina giving me some eyes back there, like pressure wash the house. We have some squeaky doors that have been squeaking for a long time. And I know WD-40 and just a little squirt would take care of that, right? I mean, but it's still on my list without a mark through it. <laughs> reminders. Reminders are very important. And there, there are types of reminders, right? There are good reminders and there are bad reminders, What's a bad reminder? A bad reminder is the consequence of something you forgot, right? The good reminders. Good reminders are reminders that we give to ourselves ahead of time. This morning, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 through 21, and this comes in the midst of a Lenten reading, and I believe that it served as a good reminder for Israel in a time that they had plenty of bad news. To set the context a bit, Isaiah prophesies to the nation of Israel during their collapse and subsequent deportation as exiles to Babylon. They had lost it all. They lost their land, their homes, possessions, their livelihood. And there was probably some layer of loss that they experienced in thinking that in losing all those things, they also lost God. Have you ever been there before? You've experienced great loss in your life and... You wonder if God was lost as well. As the Israelites were in transition to Babylon, they were in a, in a great state of grief. Grieving what they had lost in the life ahead that may never ever be the same. We hopefully have not experienced becoming exiles because of a national collapse, but we all understand the pain of grief in our own lives. Live long enough and you will experience loss. Kristen Johnson Largan, in a, in a work that I use quite often to prepare sermons called Feasting on the Word, writes, The grim shadow of past tragedies, the way in which those ghosts of past loss, shame, and grief swirl around us and cloud our vision, preventing us from seeing anything but darkness and despair. That, that is grief. Think about what we've experienced, the sudden deaths, broken relationships, bad decisions, the cruelty of others, the cruelty of our own selves. There is much sometimes in life that we find that we grieve. And so this morning as we continue journeying through this season of Lent, this season of uh, of, of offering ourselves to God and asking God to shine a light on our souls, on our hearts. It's, it's very possible that we may find things in that self-reflection and giving ourselves to God that maybe God doesn't want us to see in our own selves. Things that we need to lay down, repent of, and turn to Jesus and pursue Him instead of whatever it is, fill in the blank. In that journey, there is grief. In that journey, I believe that we can find ourselves being like these exiles, not knowing exactly what lies ahead. I ask you to turn to the scriptures. If you have a copy of the Word of God, uh, we'll be in Isaiah chapter 43. But again, the scriptures will be on our screens. And here is what the prophet Isaiah says. This is what the Lord says, He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, 
who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself that they may proclaim my praise. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is God's reminder to Israel in this time of transition, this time of mourning, this time of grief. And I believe that there's a great message for us today, a great reminder. God's good reminder to Israel and to us is number one, first, based on God's character that does not change. You see how Isaiah began in in verse 16? He didn't just say the Lord says and here's what it is. He qualified who the Lord is, didn't he? He talked about who God is. He says, this is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. That's a pretty big entrance, isn't it? Pretty, he listed a lot of credentials there. And that's because the people needed to remember that, that God's character does not change. The same way that God showed up for Israel at another time when they were in a land that wasn't their own, when they were slaves in Egypt, that's what Isaiah is referring to. That's what God is, is in giving this message to Isaiah to prophesy to Israel, is referring to himself as. He was, he's not only the Lord, the God, who, uh, the God of heaven and earth, the one who sits on the throne. He's the one who's shown up before. He's the one who doesn't change. He didn't show up one time in the past, and he's not going to show up now. And so he reminds them that when Egypt was ensla- uh, uh, Israel was enslaved in Egypt, and they so longed to be able to just have a day off. Do you remember that's how it began? Day after day in Egypt, they woke up, they made bricks for Pharaoh, they went to sleep. Day after day after day after day after day. They didn't know what seven days was. They all just seemed like the same day over and over and over and over again. There was no rhythm set up. There was no week system. That's, what, that's what's so essential about the, seven, the, the Sabbath. We work six days and we rest on the Sabbath. It's, it's, it's part of the, 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 the rhythm. It's, it's the rhythm that was established in creation when God created for six days and then on the seventh day God rested. And then on the eighth day God made sweet tea. Nobody? Come on now. I'm trying to see some smiles on some faces. I know it's weird starting church at 1030 I want to make sure you're you're awake, okay? Everybody okay? You're following with me, okay? That's that rhythm of rest. We talked about that a few Wednesdays back, about the rhythm of rest and how important rest is. And that's what they wanted. The the, the Israelites wanted that day of rest where they could seek God, where they could worship the Lord. They wanted to go out into the desert. I mean, not a great place to go, but they just wanted to go out there to be amongst one another and to worship the Lord. And Pharaoh was like, no, no, that's not going to happen. And it's a... So God kept God used Moses. Moses would go, and, and you remember the ten plagues ended up coming, and finally Pharaoh let them go, and, and then he decided as they were leaving that he needed to pursue them. They came up to the Red Sea, and at that time, water, any time people saw water, they saw a barrier. They didn't see opportunity. The ways that we see water today, we see an ocean, we think we got a plain, we can cross it, right? We see a creek around here, eastern North Carolina, we've got a lot of creeks, a lot of rivers. We say there's got to be a bridge over it. Sometimes when we have big hurricanes that flood some stuff and break some stuff, we got to figure out how to navigate around it. That's kind of the mindset that the Israelites were in. They're coming up to, the, the, the Egyptian army is, 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 is chasing after them. They're coming up to the Red Sea, and they're like, what are we going to do? And then God parts the Red Sea. God rescues them. So that's what Isaiah is talking about when he's introducing the Lord. He's not just saying he's, he's the Lord. He's saying he's the Lord who's done this. He's the one who made a way through the sea. He made a path through that, those mighty waters. 
who drew out the chariots and the horses. He's talking about Pharaoh's army as they came down to cross the Red Sea as well. And the army, re, the, and the, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again. When the waters came back in, they were extinguished. They were snuffed out like a wick. God thought it was important that the people remember how he's shown up in the past. James chapter 1 verse 17 tells us that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Sometimes we're tempted to think that God has changed. That maybe there's something we need to do to earn his, his love again. But if he's given it to us once, he'll give it to us for all time. Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verse 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Our circumstances change, but God does not. So he tells them what he has done before he can do again. And then he says something that seems pretty awkward. In verse 18, he just told them about the past. He, introduced, he was introducing himself to them, reintroducing himself, reminding them about how he's been there. But he says in verse 18, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? God's second part of his reminder to Israel and his reminder to us is that God longs to have a new work happen through us. God longs to do a new work in our church. God was longing for the Israelites to do a new work through them. Jeremiah 29, 11 is one of my favorite verses. It's one of many of our favorite verses. It's a good coffee mug verse. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you probably have it on a coffee mug. Hey, when I was at NC State, I had it on a, on a little, uh, my mom would give me this little plastic thing like that, and it, probably, it had some sort of scenery in the background, and it said, uh, Jer- had Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and to give you hope in the future, not to harm you. I would read that verse over and over while I was in college. I would remind myself that God desires to do great things in my life. I may not understand them at the time. And I tell you, there were many days that I didn't know what was going to happen next. I didn't know where my journey would take me. I was doing poultry science at that time, and I enjoyed the chickens and turkeys, but let me just tell you, I knew it wasn't my purpose. I didn't wake up with this burning desire to, to go and feed chickens and turkeys. Okay? I just didn't... I didn't, it, it wasn't part, it wasn't like, I can't wait to change the world. To, and there are people, I believe, who were called to do that and change the world, but it wasn't for me. I remember there was a time I was like, maybe I could go to a third world country one, one day and help them raise chickens and turkeys. But still for me, it wasn't, that wasn't, I couldn't talk myself into that. You, you ever been there before? You try to talk yourself into that being your thing, being your purpose? I remember having phone calls with my mom and dad calling them from college, and I, I just, two years into it, I just don't feel like this is my purpose. And thankfully, they encouraged me. They said, you can go to seminary one day with a poultry science degree. <laughs> so I finished my degree, but I knew that God wanted to do a new work in me. And I knew that the circumstances that surrounded me and the context that I was in was not the thing. And so I had to be patient. Patience is a hard, it's a hard thing, isn't it? We're not supposed to pray for patience, right? You ever been told that? That was, a, that was one of the Christianese jokes growing up. Here's the deal. If you don't yearn to develop patience in your life, you're erratic and impulsive most of the time. So, And if you pray for patience, I don't believe God is going to put you in positions where you need to be more patient. He's already going to do that. You're already going to have those experiences. Amen? So let's seek the Lord Let's ask him to give us patience. How many of us this morning find ourselves in a, in a space that we need to be patient in? We need to trust the process. We need to trust what God has told uh, the, the nation of Israel through the prophet Jeremiah. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope 
in the future. God is always about doing a new thing, having a plan, having purpose. One of our youth read for us, uh, Lewis, last week, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? Y'all remember? A new creation. A new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. God is always about doing a new work. He reminds them first that, that what he's going to do is based on the character of God that doesn't change. But he's going to do a new work. And lastly, this new work will be a good work and will be a blessing to the whole world. If we pick back up in uh, verse 19, the end of verse 19, I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. God's telling them that what they're going to do is going to be a blessing to people who are outside of the family. That's where the, the, those weird animals, the jackals and the owls, come into like, what God is going to do, God is going to, he, he's going to take these deserts, and he's going to put streams through them, he's going to take this wasteland that wasn't able to, in, to have inhabitants or any life, and he's going to bring life because of his goodness, because of his plan. It makes me think of John three sixteen. We love that verse, don't we? We like to emphasize the believe part of that, though. We like to emphasize the response, and we should emphasize the responsibility of, of, of a person putting their faith and trust in Jesus. But this is how Jesus began that verse when he said it to Nicodemus in the dark of the night. He said, For God so loved the world, every single person on this planet, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting, eternal life. For God so loves every single person. And we know people, we have people in our own circles of influence, don't we? who aren't part of the family of God. We actually have, I'm sure we all have people and know people who aren't only not part of the family of God, but they don't want a single thing to do with it. Amen? Any, I mean, if, if, unless, unless we've closed ourselves off to anybody like that. And that is okay to, to understand and to know. And I believe that what God wants to do in us individually is, is, is to shape us in a way that we're a blessing to those people. Shape our ministry so that we're a blessing to our community. To people who will never step foot inside of First Baptist Church's doors unless we go to them. Unless we are participating with God making streams in the barrenness. Streams in the desert. Streams in the wasteland. You know, I was thinking about this this morning. I was thinking about, about the trust that we put in other people, but sometimes we forget to put in God. I'm just interested. How many of y'all have ever had a surgery before? Anybody ever had? I'm going to have to have a surgery coming up. I got a little hernia, umbilical hernia situation going on. And Gina's like, now's the time. Now that we have good insurance, it's, tough. it's the time. Like, maybe I can get worse insurance. Anybody? I'm, anyway, so I'm going to have to have surgery. And I'm, and I'm thinking about this. I'm like, well, the longer I wait, whoever is going to do surgery on me is getting older. And so their hands might shake a little bit as they get older. I don't know, you know, we all get older. And as we get older, our bodies become imperfect and get umbilical hernias or whatever. We've ever, you know, a couple years ago, I had to have uh, had a benign tumor on behind my ear. And thankfully, it was benign. We didn't know that until it was out, scaring me to death. But we trust ourselves to a surgeon, don't we? I think sometimes we trust ourselves to a surgeon, to an imperfect person who's going to be cutting on us easier than we do to the God that we can't necessarily see and hold right before us, but his evidence is all around us. Think about that. We find it much easier sometimes to schedule a surgery than to allow God to direct our everyday lives. But God has demonstrated, he begins by giving them this reminder, demonstrating that he has done it before, and what he's done before he can do again. But you don't have to dwell so much on that past thing that I did because I'm going to do it in a new way. 
I'm going to bring about something new in your lives. In the midst of your grief, you need this good reminder, Israel, to know I'm not done with you yet. And you need to understand that it's not just going to be for you, it's going to be for all people. What God had begun in Abraham, the call, the promise that all the world would be blessed, even though these people are being taken from their land, they're being taken as exiles to Babylon, God's not done. And then Jesus would tell Nicodemus that God so loves the world that he sent his one and only son, that his plan continues. First Baptist Church, I, I, I want to encourage you and in, in, in hope that you will take this as a good reminder this morning, this message, that although it's, the words are nearly 3,000 years old, that the message is still for us today just as it was for Israel, just as it was for our parents and our grandparents, and, and I'm sure the people who were the founding members of First Baptist Church and those early missionaries who came on the boat over to the, this new land to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. These words continue today and they will generation after generation after generation to inspire us to experience God and what he wants to do that's new in our midst. But let me tell you this morning, that does not dismiss any grief that we may feel at how things used to be as they're transitioning to how they're going to be. Just a moment, I want to be, I, I, I preach from my heart. I share from my heart. I don't know any way, other way to do that. The only people in my life who've ever moved me have been people who have preached like that and taught like that. And so that's just how I am. We're coming up on uh, one year of our family being here with you guys in Farmville. And while it's been a glorious, I mean, just, just the the best first year I can imagine being your pastor. It's also been a year of grief. I didn't understand what loss was until Gina and I, well, I experienced the loss of my father uh, about six years ago. And I've shared with you, guys, with you all about that from the pulpit here. And in, that, in that journey and in using resources and reading books on grief and on loss, I came to understand that that loss and grief takes many shapes and many forms. We can experience great loss and grief with the loss of a loved one. We can even experience similar grief at the loss of a pet, the loss of jobs, a new job, the loss when a family moves from one place to a new location, changing of schools. Just because it's a it's moving in the direction of God and it's exciting. doesn't mean there's not also a, an experience of loss. Does that make sense? Like the house we used to live in in Zebulon. Uh, the other night, Jean and I were looking for some, through some pictures, uh, trying to find a picture so she wanted to show her friend some. Anyway, and we came across some pictures of the old house. And y'all, we hadn't really thought about it a, a lot, but all of a sudden we're like, oh man, we, we started, memory started coming back at parties that we have, you know, birthday parties and doing things in the backyard and different things. And we started thinking about our, our Kobe that, you know, that made it one night here once we moved. And, he, you know, he was our dog, uh, our, our oldest of our three Jack Russells. And, and, you know, over this past year, of, you know, and coming here, the relationship I had with my former pastor that I served under and the secretary I was very close to and the other staff members, I missed him a whole lot. And so while I have no doubts that God opened this door wide open for us to come, that transition still, this transition to this new thing, this beautiful thing, this God call still involved some loss and some grief. And it's okay to acknowledge that. And let me tell you, church, our church is changing. The church that First Baptist Church was five years ago, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, 20 years ago is not the same church that it is today and it's not the same church that's going to be 5 years and 10 years from now and it's okay for us to acknowledge that that is a loss even in the midst of God doing a new and beautiful thing 
You understand? You follow with me. The famous last seven words of the church is, we've never done it that way before. Okay? The famous last words of the church should be the Great Commission. Amen? It should be the Great Commission. Look, I know a lot of things have changed. I know we got a brand new organ. We got some drums here. We, uh, we started worship at 10.30 a.m., which I heard one person say they've never started worship on a half hour before. Okay? I get it. I get it. Okay? Sunday school class numbers may be a while before we see a whole lot of activity there. And many of us have memories of when it used to be bustling and we didn't have enough room in Sunday school rooms. Let me tell you, it's okay to grieve what it used to be, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't seek for what God is doing now because God, God is doing a wonderful, miraculous, mighty work through us. It's not wishful thinking. Y'all, it's, it's happening. And we each have a responsibility to walk into it, to be part of it. We voted last week to, to expand our virtual ministry, which is pretty much brand new for our church in the, the length of our history, right? Yeah. And so we've, we're going to be expanding on that, on that front. We voted last week that we're going to be pursuing a full-time minister with youth, community, and virtual ministries which is a leap of faith, but it's a brand new thing that God is leading us to do. Y'all understand, I understand we're moving, but I believe that we're moving in a great direction as we follow God. As one person said, there's no better person to take a leap of faith with than God. Amen? Amen. You know, I, I, I told y'all when I first came here, I have a vision of that baptistry, of us wearing out our baptistry committee with coming up here and filling up the water on Saturdays, baptizing people as they begin their faith in Jesus Christ and that journey with Jesus Christ. It's only the beginning, brothers and sisters. I have a vision of our youth group rising to even greater heights. It's only the beginning. You know, we experienced last week, I have a vision of our youth becoming more instrumental in leadership areas within our church, within our worship service. It's only the beginning. Let me remind you, it's only the beginning. I believe God is going to blow our minds with what he has planned for us in this coming season. God is all about new things and he's all about good things and he wants us to have a good reminder. As a claim comes now, we're going to transition into our uh, closing uh, worship song. It's called The Goodness of God. And it's important for us in the in our lives, it doesn't matter what's going on. We need to focus on the, the goodness of God. We had Zach bring our word last week, and he talked about fear, why we shouldn't fear. And it's a no-brainer for us. Ain't, ain't it? It's a no-brainer if we consider who God is. If God is with us, there's absolutely nothing we should be fearful of. So this morning, I want to invite you to stand. Straighten your legs, that'll bring you up. Stand on up with us. And as we worship and as we sing this song, The Goodness of God, let's, re let's remember that God is completely worthy of being sung to about how good He is because God is, God is good. God is full of love. God is full of mercy. Even when we mess up big time, Israel had not been, been on the straight and narrows with God. They kept messing up, and part of that is the collapse of their nation and them, them being exiled and deported to Babylon. But God was still good to them in the midst. I don't care where you're at right now. God's desire is to be good to you. God's desire is to be good to our church. Let's not be the one who, who holds back the movement of God. Let's join Him. And as we join Him, it begins with worship. It begins with pouring ourselves out to the Lord. I do want to give you an invitation this morning as we're singing in worship. If you feel moved this morning and you want to do, um, have a response, uh, we have our, the front pew this morning is a, is a place where you can come in the middle of the song, and I'll see you from playing the drums. And at the conclusion of the song, Johnny will keep playing some, just some melody song, some music, and I'll come down and talk to you. We'll figure out what your response is. But if you want to join the, 
this church today, as a member of First Baptist Church, don't let anything hold you back. Maybe you've, been, you've started this relationship with God through Jesus and you've given Him your life, but you haven't made it public. Don't let anything hold you back. Or maybe there's something else this morning you, you want to pray about. Don't let, it, don't let anything hold you back. Come down to the front and in whatever way you come, I'll receive you in the name of Jesus. Let's worship. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, for your love, for all the beautiful things that you long to give us, you long and desire that your children would possess, that we would hold deeply in our hearts, that we would allow to give us guidance in life to direct our paths. Lord, we thank you that, that we can rely on who you are, on who you've been, that in 
in dark nights of the soul, Lord, when things aren't the, the, the easiest, that we can look in the scriptures and that we can see how you uh, have revealed yourself and how you have um, engaged and had relationship with, with people. And we thank you that we can see how you have uh, rescued the world through Jesus Christ and give given the opportunity for us to have relationship through believing and trusting in Jesus with our lives and then gifting us with the Holy Spirit. But God, just as we're able to see that, God, help us also to trust in, in the new thing that you're doing and entrusting and calling us to do so that we will be a blessing to the whole world. God, we believe that you're, that you're going to use us to, to reach people that are far from you, and we pray that we will follow you in the midst of that. So in Jesus' holy name, we give you praise for this day, and we thank you for the week to come. Amen. May you go in peace.